So first off, thank you guys for coming. Um, just to give you a very brief background about me, um, like Shoshana said, my name is Drew. I come from MakerBot. And I'm on a team at MakerBot called the MakerBot Learning Team. So what we do, um, it's a small team. There's only three of us. But what we do is we do trainings for 3D printing on MakerBot on our printers. So we go around the country. We also hold workshops at our headquarters in Brooklyn. And we train people on using 3D printers. Even though the workshops are open to everybody, we almost exclusively work with educators. So I'm really excited to be here for the back to school event. So we have probably about 70 to 80% of MakerBot Learning's customers end up being in the education field, or some, I'm using education kind of loosely, but in related to education in some way. So we've done a lot of work with educators over the past year and a half or so of that MakerBot Learning has been in existence. So what I'm gonna do today is walk you through some of our experiences working with educators. I'm gonna take you through some of the resources that we have available, and I'm gonna talk about MakerBot in the Classroom, which is a book that some of you have hard copies of, and we'll talk about how the rest of you can get copies, at least soft copies of them later. Um, yeah, and we'll go through like that. Sound good? OK, so I asked this before. I don't know if everybody was in the room already, but how many people here are actually teachers, educators? OK, cool. So a little, probably half, maybe a little over half. How many people have used a 3D printer before? Wow. How many people have seen a 3D printer before? Almost everybody. OK. so. To give you a very, very basic overview of what a 3D printer is, again, this is, this is removing a lot of the details, but a 3D printer is simply a tool that takes something digital and turns it into something physical. So the same way that you would type up a paper on your, on your computer, you type up a paper, you have a digital copy of it. You press print on your 2D printer, you get a, a physical copy of it. 3D printing works the same way, a couple different mechanics, but essentially the same way, where you have a digital copy of something. So this model here on the left, this was made in a 3D design software, a CAD software. On the right, this is once that file was printed on a 3D printer. That's a physical copy, a phys physical representation of the digital model that was made. But here's a quick time lapse just to show you what the printing process looks like. So as you could tell, while it was printing, if you've seen the printers before, like most of you have, the way that it works is building objects. It builds them layer by layer, starting at the foundation, starting at the bottom, building things layer by layer in about paper thin layers, as thin as 0.1 millimeters per layer. So think about like if you were to use the best analogy people draw between this type of technology, this 3D printing, and you know something in the real world is to use a hot glue gun. So you take the ink of the printer, which is the filament, which comes on spools like this. Feed it into the printer, heats up, melts out, and then comes out much like a hot glue gun, comes out the nozzle. And then that glue gun is moving all around, layer by layer, building up your object. So if you picture if you had a hot glue gun, if you drew a circle, let it cool, drew another circle on top of that, let it cool, drew another one, you'd slowly be building up a cylinder, right? Works the same way, except this time on a printer, on a 3D printer, it's building it in super, super thin layers. And over a long period of time, you end up with your final model. And the models can be quite a bit more intricate than if you were doing it by hand. Uh, with a hot glue gun. First section I'm going to go, go through is current stories. These are either experiences that me or my people from my team have been, you know, have been to schools or been to places where 3D printers have, have been integrated successfully. I'll walk you through some of those. Then I'll talk about MakerBot in the Classroom, which is, again, the book that, uh, that many of you are holding right now. And then I'll go through some other resources that are definite need, need reads if you're getting into 3D printing. All right. OK, so the way that I've broken up these stories, which hopefully this, this flow makes a bit of sense, is the way I see it currently is people that are integrating 3D printing into their classrooms, they fall into one of three categories. 
First category is people that have access to 3D printing, and the way that they've integrated it is complementing something that already existed. So maybe they had a project in place already. Maybe they had several projects already that were already successful. Then they were given a 3D printer, or they purchased a 3D printer, or they had access to a 3D printer through some local means. And they figured out a way to tweak the project, tweak the curriculum, tweak some aspect to include 3D printing, but not reinventing the wheel. Second tier is people who, again, they've gotten access to a 3D printer, and they've thought about, maybe they've had experience, maybe they used it for a year or two. And they're starting to rethink what their projects look like, what their classes look like now that they have a 3D printer involved. And then the third tier, these are like the kind of the expert users, our power users. These are people that are creating brand new courses, brand new programs, new initiatives, all based around 3D printing and a lot of the technology that goes around with that. So I'm going to give you examples from each of these tiers or each of these categories. And hopefully there's, you can find something that you can relate to. OK, so the first of my tier one examples is um, this school. This is a school in New York, uh, the MacArthur Bar Middle School. So the teacher, the guy here in the green kind of leaning over, his name is Vinnie Garrison. He's a technology teacher at the MacArthur School. And for several years, he ran, the, he ran a CO2 car project. Has anyone heard of the CO2 car project? If you're a science teacher, you've probably seen it. If you haven't, think of it like a um, like Pinewood Derby, but kind of on steroids. Like there's cars that you make out of wooden blocks, but instead of rolling them down a hill, you actually put a CO2 cartridge in the back and puncture it, and it goes whoosh, flying across the classroom. It's pretty awesome. Never done it. Uh, but anyway, so he, he ran this project successfully for several years before he had access to a 3D printer. Once he got access, he has two 3D printers or maybe three 3D printers in his room, in his classroom. So he thought about some way that he could tweak the project to include 3D printing. So to give you kind of a basic understanding, Students with a CO2, CO2 car project are given a 12-inch block of wood, balsa wood. They're given a set of wheels and axles and all the hardware necessary to make a car. So the principle is pretty simple. Basically, the more weight you remove, the faster your car will go. When you race the cars, the one with the less weight typically wins. Just because you're moving it forward, less weight means less resistance. So what the students do, and what they did, again, before 3D printing, is they would take the block, they'd shave off as much material as they could while keeping their car intact. They'd race them, they'd say who, they see who would win. What Vinnie Garrison's idea was to tweak this project was now that they've done that, they've kind of become accustomed to removing material from the block, he actually had them design and print their own wheels. So again, the area that was before it was kind of a standard. So everyone had the same set of wheels. That was the same amount of weight. Now the students are designing and printing their own wheels to go on their custom vehicles. So again, another way to reduce weight. And what I'll go through in a minute is you know, I'll talk about the software and different ways that you can dictate the weight of your final part. Let me show you, this is a quick video showing, explaining that process. I'm Vinny Garrison. I teach technology here at A. MacArthur Bar Middle School. I'm teaching the fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth graders. Well, the kids design a car, they build a car, they race a car. The car is based on weight. So they know if they make the wheels as thin, and as light as they can, it's going to be a big advantage. Last year was the first year we started 3D printing wheels. It's doubled kind of the engineering aspect of it, really. They were designing the car and building the car. Well, now they're designing the wheels and building the wheels. For, for what I do in here is I talk about form and function. You want to make something fast? We're, we're dealing with function. So I'm going to set up the track. Guys, guys, your cars need to be here if you haven't raced, okay? All right, and you guys are up. It's trigger time. All righty, guys. Hey, we got two cars coming. Heads up. Are you guys ready? Three, two, one. The Every kid got at least three or four runs. I would take their best time, and I'd, I'd use Excel and put them in order. Whoa! I started a new list last year, and at the time, the record was 0.701, and now it's 0.643. It's five hundredths of a second. It doesn't sound like a long amount of time, but in this, it is. <laughs> I guess they put it together. They, they really put together the weight to speed, they understood that ratio. <laughs> now it's like an arms race in terms of how light, how thin, how much wheel can I leave? You know, it's, it's, it's completely engineering. I have kids engineering parts, parts that don't exist. They're starting from nothing and they're making stuff that they're using. There's gonna be things they do here and they're gonna get to college and the teacher's gonna go, oh, well, okay, you're good. You know how to do this. 
So again, the idea of that, right, there's a project that was already in place. Teacher has access to 3D printing, figures out, OK, what's some way I can tweak this project that already exists, all the framework is already built. But now that I have access to this technology, how can I integrate it into my class You know, using kind of lowering the barrier a little bit, right? Some other quick examples from what I'm calling tier one, the schools that are doing um, similar ideas. On the left here, there's a school in Louisville. This is a middle school in Louisville that um, this came from an art class. Part of one of the first projects that they do in that art class is they create a monogram. The students create a monogram for themselves. They create it by hand first. Then they do it in Photoshop. Um, and then what this teacher did, since they already had the file in Photoshop, and actually the process from taking something from Photoshop, turning it into a 3D model is not that difficult. So this teacher had them, once again, once they had access to 3D printers, they took this a step further. The teacher took this a step further, had the students take the monogram that was in Photoshop and generate keychains for themselves. So then all of a sudden, the students have this tangible object from the monogram that they created. And the last one from my tier one is on the right here. This is a fourth grade lesson. So basically, he used to run a project that he would have students design tinfoil boats. So kids would get a certain amount of tinfoil, fold them up however they saw fit, put them in a little tub of water, and whichever one could hold the most weight would win the contest. And he had them design their own boats. So you can see the shapes that they came up with were pretty amazing. And again, this is fourth grade. So they're designing in a CAD program. They're printing out objects, and then they're testing them. Same, same project, just introducing 3D printing as the medium instead of using something that already existed. Now we're going into our tier two school. So just to remind you, like tier two is something that I'm defining as it's kind of the middle ground. So they haven't redefined everything now that they have a 3D printer, but they're starting to rethink teachers and educators that are starting to rethink how projects are structured because of their access to 3D printers. So this one comes from the Whitby School in Connecticut. The teacher in the blue shirt here, her name is Leslie. She has three or four MakerBot replicators in her classroom. She teaches technology at a middle school at the Whitby School. And one of the big focuses of her lessons in her technology class, her design technology class, is what's called the design cycle. So students are really pressed to come up with an idea, prototype that idea, and iterate on it several times until they come up with their final solution, as opposed to making one thing and that being the final product. So obviously, 3D printing relates to that pretty well. The cost of making things is pretty cheap. You have a file that's already digital. You can modify it pretty easily once you've tested your original prototype. So iterate, you know, emphasizing that design cycle in middle school is a pretty amazing thing. So one of the projects that they did, which she'll talk about here in a minute, is this was last year. They had um, She created a whole project called the Whitby Harbor Project, where the students designed, again, this is using Tinkercad also, designed an entire town, a harbor town, on their own, made their own buildings, their own furniture. They made boats, vehicles, all things designed in 3D and CAD, printed them out, and then arranged them on this big structure you know, in, within their classroom. The future of using 3D printing, I think, is here. My name is Leslie Perry. I teach design technology, so I'm teaching them how to be creative and how to solve problems. My goal is to spark an interest in the students. This is the design technology classroom. The most popular part of our room is our MakerBot 3D printers. We have a number of them. The students come in here and they're like, are we 3D printing today? Are we 3D printing? My name is Jessica and I go to Whitby School and I'm in sixth grade. We learned how to move shapes around and put them together, make it so you can rotate and you could see all the directions. When they first see the 3D printers, they're really, really excited to use them. That's what gets them focused and excited to get, to get going. I found a tutorial to help them to learn by making a boat, and that's how Whitby Harbor was born. My name is Bruce. I am a sixth grader. The last project I worked on, we were making anything related to a harbor, so houses, docks, boats. I got to figure out what I wanted to do, what shape I wanted to have, if I wanted to have steam coming out of the top of the boat. These students are going to need to learn to be able to create in 3D and print in 3D, and not just print in 3D with plastic. My favorite part of 3D printing is that I get to make whatever I want to and use my imagination to create something that may have never been made before. They, they figure something out, they print it out, maybe it fails, 
but they're learning every time of how to make that better. Most basic concept I've learned is to go through what we call the design cycle. First, think of an idea, then make multiple versions of it, and then evaluate which one is the best, and then continue pushing it further until it's perfected. I don't care what industry you're in, you're using that process of improvement all the time. And they're learning that in a natural and fun way. All right, so two other examples that fit, again, within this, this second tier of schools. On the left here, there's um, a student at a high school in New Jersey. His name is Justin. And basically what you're looking at is this is a prototype. He kind of came up with his own project. but he shared a locker or was next to a locker of um, another student who had a disability and therefore had trouble opening her locker because of the locker mechanism. So him, along with his technology uh, instructor, his technology teacher, came up with this project idea to help her, to build something that would help her open her locker a bit easier. So he took it upon himself, created this own project, like I said, produced several prototypes of this object, and eventually came up with one that worked. He fixed it to her locker and allowed her to open her locker quite a bit easier. So again, rethinking the idea of a project because you have access to something like 3D printing. And then on the right here, um, we have, this was actually just a story that popped up last week. This is a school I was talking to in New Jersey. It's an architecture school. And what they used to do, they had a student-run service where there was an architecture, like a 2D print service. So basically, they had large format printers. Student, architecture students who were designing buildings could send their, their blueprint plans to this service. The students who were working there would analyze them, would print them out, and would charge a certain amount for them. They recently made an investment into several 3D printers. And they've now, using the exact same business model, they're now doing 3D printed models. So the architecture students who were previously submitting blueprints are now submitting the actual 3D models of their files and coming to pick up the actual models, the 3D models, you know, full, you know, whatever the scale that they set. Um, from this from the service. So not completely reinventing the wheel, using the same framework but adding 3D printing into the mix. And then the last of the three tiers, again, this is, these are educators who are kind of rethinking programs, rethinking initiatives because of their access to 3D printing. This is from the McConaughey School in Indiana. There are two teachers there, Ron and Corey, that I worked with actually last summer when they were doing their research and development phase of this project. But essentially, what they wanted to do was they were trying to address the females in engineering and STEM-related fields issue, where it's obviously it's been historically a male-dominated industry. So what they did is they wanted to create a girls-only STEAM STEM club. So they threw around a funding and through a donation, they act, they got two 3D printers into this classroom, and they ran at the end of school. They created a whole new course, a 20-minute course, a girls engineering course. And what they would do is they'd teach them CAD skills, they'd teach them drafting skills, and they had them create and design and print their own prototypes of parts so that they could get a little bit more energy into that you know, as before they moved into high school. Two other examples that fit into this category. On the left here, these are pictures from a library in Boston. The library was struggling because most of their clientele was on the, you know, on the older side, and they were trying to they were trying to attract more younger kids to come into the library to use their resources. So what they did is they started building an entire teen center. There was a whole, other, whole bunch of other things that went along with that. They built a video game center. They had like a movie studio. They had a computer lab. And then in addition to that, what they wanted to do was they purchased the MakerBot Starter Lab, which again is a bundle of several 3D printers. And they're offering 3D printing classes so that kids can come in, use it as their own space, make things that they want to make. Uh, and, and again, attract that younger generation into their, into their space. And then on the right here, this is probably actually deserves its own category. This is the University of Maryland. University of Maryland is one of six currently there's, uh, MakerBot Innovation Centers. So this is essentially like a big scale investment into 3D printing. They, the Terrapin Works, which is, falls underneath University of Maryland, is part of this big initiative to provide digital manufacturing tools to first to their engineering school, but then eventually to their entire 40,000 student body, and then eventually even more so to the community that surrounds the University of Maryland. So this, this innovation center, this room that you see here, this is in the same building as another fabrication lab, which has a whole machine shop and other like large industrial 3D printers. Also in the same, under the same roof as a completely student-run startup shell, like basically a, a business incubator where students submit ideas to a student board 
for business ideas. They're accepted. They get some money to explore their ideas. They have access to the Innovation Center to prototype their ideas, and then go on to build businesses from there. So part of a, a much bigger initiative to provide tools like this to everyone uh, and their campus. OK, so that is a small sampling of education use cases that I've seen and that my team has seen. OK, so MakerBot in the Classroom is, like I mentioned before, it's a book that MakerBot recently put out. This is targeted at our education. It's applicable to a lot. I'm using the term education loosely. This is edu you know, schools, libraries, maker spaces, universities, things like that. And actually, lots of the book can be adapted to anyone that's just interested in getting into 3D printing. So a little bit about the inspiration behind the book, um, behind MakerBot in the Classroom. Like I said, our team travels a lot. We go a lot around to a lot of schools. We speak with a lot of teachers. We speak with a lot of students. We have a whole education team also at MakerBot that was doing a whole round of research from educators, finding out what they were thinking. And what we found out was that a lot of teachers and students had access to 3D printing through in their own school or somewhere local. But they weren't exactly sure what they could do to get started. They didn't have ideas for how to integrate it. They needed some inspiration. They needed like a jumping off point. So that was how MakerBot in the Classroom was born. This is the first of many initiatives to try to give people ideas, stepping stones to get into using 3D printing in their classroom. So the way in which we do that is MakerBot in the Classroom is broken up into three main sections. The first section um, is what's called an introduction to 3D printing. So this goes through in much greater detail what I spoke about at the beginning of the presentation, which is how 3D printers work, what 3D printing is, what different types of 3D printers are, because there's lots of different types of technology out there. Uh, MakerBot only uses one of those types, but there's lots of different types of 3D printing. We also go through the software that I spoke of, MakerBot Desktop. That's what people use. That's what you need to use to prepare prints on your MakerBot 3D printer. So we go through in depth about how to use that and what the process looks like from designing something to bring it into MakerBot Desktop to finally printing out the final part, like you'll see in front of you. We then go into what's called the three ways to make. This is something that we reference at our trainings, every training that we do. Three ways to make basically means the three different, the three different ways, three major ways that you can get a file, get a model for 3D printing. The first of that is going to be tapping into the community. So there's a website called Thingiverse. Have you all heard of Thingiverse? Yes, some yes, some no. I'll talk more about Thingiverse in a little bit. But Thingiverse basically is an online community where people share their 3D printable files. There's somewhere close to a million free downloadable designs on Thingiverse. You log on, see what other people have made, and designed, and shared, all covered under the Creative Commons license. So for free, you can download it, print it out, modify it any way you want. So that would be the first. Second um, would be 3D scanning. If you have access to a 3D scanner, you can take an existing model take a 3D scan of it to generate a digital model of it. And you can replicate that on a 3D printer. You can modify it and then print out different iterations of it. We've seen some really cool applications of that. For example, um, there was a teacher I was working with that was running a sculpture class. And what she had the students do was sculpt a form in clay, plop it on the MakerBot digitizer, take a 3D scan of it, and then bring it into a digital sculpting program where then the students further iterated and made some other sculpting features on it and then printed out several different copies of that. So starting with the original form, physical, taking it digital, and making a bunch of modifications to it. So really, really interesting applications from that. And then the third of the three ways to make, which is definitely the most exciting and the widest open of the three, which is using 3D design software. Tons of different options for 3D design. Even free options now. This has been a really good couple years for free tools for 3D design. So ways that you can log on to any, any number of sites, which I'll go through later. Make your own design custom to you and print it out on your 3D printer. And then the last major bulk section of the book, we go through four main projects, four project ideas that include knowledge checks, um, the kind of step-by-step -step lesson plans, materials needed, learning objectives, all the things that you, you could need to kind of jumpstart an idea, a project within your classroom. Mm -hmm. So just to give you a quick sample of what you might find in the book, and again, if you have the book in front of you, you're welcome to follow along. If not, we'll tell you how to get access to the digital copy of this. So something like in the beginning of the book, in the intro section, you'll read about what 3D printing is, like I was talking about. This goes through what FDM is. FDM is the type of technology that, 3D, that MakerBot 3D printers use. That's the hot glue gun analogy that I keep referencing. Other things that you'll find in the 
beginning section of the book are tips and tricks. Again, targeted toward educators, but relevant to everyone who is using a 3D printer. Things like where to place your 3D printer in your classroom, tools you should have around to make the cleanup process easier. Things like leveling your 3D printer, which is an extremely important process, and quick ways and tips and visual indicators of how you might tell if your printer is running well or not running well. We also go through, this is MakerBot Desktop, which I keep talking about. This is the software that dictates the output of your model on your 3D printer. This is where you can choose all sorts of settings, and I'll show you more about what that looks like in the real, no, actual models. But, um, but this is where you dictate all the settings, which can change dramatically affect the output of your 3D printer. So we go through an in-depth walkthrough of how to use that software also, since that is an integral part of printing. Something else you'll find in the book, this is something that we always bring to every single training that we go to. It's what's called our print kit. This is the essentials, the basic print kit. We often bring a lot more. As you can see, there's a lot more, several other objects that we bring also that all have different teaching points. But these are like the core. If you're going to teach somebody about 3D printing, these are things that really explain the advantages and some of the design considerations that go into making a 3D printable part. So for example, <clears throat> this apple shows, it's, it will be easier to see in real life, which I'll pass these around in a minute, but it'll be easy to see. Um, you can easily see what the different layer height res, so basically the resolution of your 3D print. If you're making something quick and big and you don't really care how the surface looks, you might choose low resolution because it will print a lot faster. Standard resolution is a good mix between low and high, and high resolution is like if you want the surface finish to look really nice. And what that's dictating is how thin or thick the layers are that make up your 3D print. It's a really great teaching tool. Overhang and bridge, this again, this shows the design considerations that you have to keep in mind when you're designing something to be printed. So on the front here, you'll see that there are these, these slopes of increasing angles all the way up from, I think, 20 all the way up to 70 degrees. So you can see, and this was printed in the orientation that you see, so flat there. You can see at the 70 degree mark, the, under, you know, the overhang starts to get a little bit choppy. So that's right about the threshold where when you're building something in 3D where you might need support material, something underneath there because gravity starts to combat you. I mentioned support material on the last slide. So this is a model, very basic model, that just shows you what happens when you have parts of your model that are over that threshold of an acceptable angle, overhang angle. So the model on the left was printed without support material. So you can see how the kind of gravity took over and pulled a lot of the, there's, it's really choppy and kind of droopy underneath the petals or the leaves of the flower. In the middle here, this was printed with support material. In a software, all this is is a checkbox. So yes, support material or no support material. Clean those off, and then you get a model that looks quite a bit cleaner. Also, and I'll pass around these during the questions also so you guys can get a better idea of what these look like. But this shows what the interior of all of your models look like. So for example, and I'll pick these up. Maybe you can see them. So for example, if I was printing this guy, if I stopped this print halfway through, it would not be completely solid, which sometimes surprises people. It's actually filled about halfway with this honeycomb structure. The reason for that is it's a decent strength to weight ratio, and also you use a lot less material. And your print time goes down dramatically versus if you printed this completely solid. One of the benefits of building something layer by layer, is a, as opposed to carving it away, is that you can do things like you can make the inside hollow or partially hollow. So you can save yourself a lot of material. You can save yourself weight. Um, and you can really affect the structural integrity of your part by messing with these settings. Print in place. This is something that's really interesting. So basically, the reason I say it's interesting is because it's unique to 3D printing. So what a print in place model is, is an assembly that is printed as a single part. So this is the chain mail, for example. This is printed as a single part, oriented something like this. Pull it off the build plate, and it moves. No assembly, no snapping, no anything like that. This is because you're building something layer by layer, and it's using bridging and overhangs like I was talking about earlier. And you can get something like this, or even surprisingly more complex than this. Last thing is designing for assembly. So something that we get asked often is, what if I want to print things in different colors? What if I want to make something that's larger than the printer build area itself? And the answer is, you can actually design things to be built in separate pieces. So something like this was designed to be printed in several different pieces and then assembled after the fact. A lot of really great teaching tools when you're starting to think about how to design things that fit together 
after you print them out. Also, which we'll talk about in a minute, this obviously has only 3D printed components, but there have been a lot of really cool uh, examples of people building things out of 3D printed components in addition to other components. I'll get to that when I talk about the bridge project in a minute. So those are the essential, that's the print kit. That's something if you're teaching about 3D printing, you always want to have your basics here. Things that show people, oh, this is what resolution means. This is what overhangs are. All the things that you need to keep in mind. And as you teach about it, you'll probably create your own print kit, your own teaching tools. But this is a great place to get started. All of these files, by the way, this whole kit that I'm talking about, is available on Thingiverse on that website. I'll tell you how to get there. They're free, downloadable designs. And they have the little blurb about what they're teaching. That's all online. And it's also referenced within the handbook, obviously. OK, and then the last four things that I'll go through in MakerBot in the Classroom are the four projects. So four major projects at the end of MakerBot in the Classroom, each of them uses a different 3D modeling tool, a different 3D design software. All of them are free. We were targeting this at educators. Sometimes budget concerns come up. So all the software that we use is free. So you can either download it, use it or it's browser-based or something like that. So you don't have to pay anything to actually use these programs. First one we go through is Tinkercad. This project prompts students to create their own country using uh, these tiny little tiles. So the idea here is students design their own little tiles using Tinkercad, using the basic functions of Tinkercad and going up through the more advanced ones. And then as a class or as a group or as a school, they assemble them together into their own board game country type thing. So obviously, there's a lot of, a lot of variability. You can scale this up. You can scale it down. You can take it to be a little bit more. You can make it a little bit more complex or simple, depending on your, on your grade range. And all of the projects that we do in the book include further activities. So the further activities for this section would be to prompt students to create transportation systems, again, furthering their 3D modeling skills, or almost act out like play in a board game, engage in some sort of trade based on the resources that they established in their respective land tiles. Just ideas to kind of get you, you know, get your thought process going. Second project that we go through is uses a program called OpenSCAD, which is quite a bit different than all the other programs that I'm talking about, because OpenSCAD is actually a code-driven uh, modeling software. So instead of directly editing and moving around a model, you're actually compiling code, and when you or you're writing code, and when you compile it, it exports, it spits out a 3D model. So obviously, a lot of great applications for math, computer science, things to think about. Great teaching moments in this um, in this project are, for example, if you you know if I was making my Drew name tag, all of a sudden I want to change my name to Michelangelo, which would be awesome. Uh, I would do that, and all of a sudden I'd see that my name doesn't fit within the border anymore, because the variable that defines my border is set to a static value. So what I would need to do is go back and change that value so that it fits, or for more advanced students, go back and figure out how I can make the variable that dictates my border relate to the size of my text. There's a lot of, again, scaling up, scaling down, a lot of different ways you could take projects like this. But the step-by-step -step basics of this project are all included with the book. Again, there's further activities that you can do. Um, the further activities here are kind of scaling up toward calculus concepts, Riemann sums, trigonometric functions. The third project, the thir third of four, is a Sculpt Your Own Fossils project. So I have a couple examples here that, again, I'll pass around in a minute. But the idea here is to use Sculptress, which is a digital sculpting tool, a bit different than using something like Tinkercad. And you'll see why when I give you a demo. But the idea here is to prompt students to create their own fossils. There are, this one is a little bit less step-by-step -step because digital sculpting isn't really follow step one. It's much more trying to mush. You're basically given a ball of clay, digital clay, and you mush it around to try to make something. So it's more so about exploring the tool and trying to make something that resembles a fossil. These are just some of the examples that came out of that. And the further activities from here, there's some interesting ones, such as one of the ideas is for students to, once they design their fossils, they write the characteristics of the animal or whatever that their fossil came from. Then they bury them, trade them with another class, other class does like a dig to uncover these fossils and try to match the traits to you know, whatever the original designer or student dig said were the traits. So a lot of interesting ways you can take things like this. Again, 3D printing, but going a little bit further than that. 
And then the last of the projects, this is um, a bridge building project. We've talked to a lot of teachers that already do a bridge building project, so we came up with this one, which was kind of like an experimental engineering project. This uses a program called 123D Design, which is probably the most advanced of the, of the four that I'll show you. So this is using balsa wood. This can also work with toothpicks, straws, anything you have around, but basically designing connector pieces, almost building your own connect set using your 3D printer. So you model them up. You have to measure all the components, design things that will fit around them, and build a structure using you know, whatever you have available plus the 3D printed parts. A lot of great teaching moments in there, too. Some further activities from here are to you know, test the actual structural integrity of, your, of whatever you built, of your bridge, of your structure, or to design something different. Design like a lark. Can you build an Eiffel Tower using this? Can you build a skyscraper using the same idea? Can, as a class, can you, can you construct some giant structure using the same principle? All right, so before I pass this around and get to questions, what, um, just a, a little bit of information about MakerBot in the classroom. If you want input on how people are using it or some of our education stuff, just uh, you can follow MakerBot EDU on social media. It's on Twitter. Um, it's probably your best bet. You can also find the link to that handbook, the digital copy of that book, on makerbot.com slash education. The full downloadable book is free to registered MakerBot users. The, there's like a 30 or 50 page sample that is downloadable for free to anyone, as long as you just type in some information. And then also, you can get onto Thingiverse, but I'm going to go through that quite a bit more in depth. So I'm going to get to that in a second. Mm -hmm. What I'll do right now is I'm going to go through, this is like the kind of the resources section. I'm going to show you some demonstrations of some of the software that we use, including Tinkercad and the other ones that we use in MakerBot in the classroom. I will show you the names of some of the other software, that, software programs that we use that we talk about. And I'll talk a little bit about Thingiverse because that's a great resource also. OK? So um, first thing is Tinkercad. Uh, if you've ever used it before, Tinkercad is free. Tinkercad is browser-based, which is why I actually have a video, because I wasn't sure about internet here. So I have a video of a screen capture that I took very late last night. And um, just to give you an idea of what it looks like, the other ones I'll actually do a live demonstration. But Tinkercad is, you can see the interface is very clean. It's very um, simple looking. It is primitive-based. So you, instead of sketching and extruding and all these things, you actually just drag and drop these pre-made 3D shapes. Almost think of it like a virtual Legos. And you can build objects using that. However, despite its simplicity of its appearance, Tinkercad is actually amazingly powerful. And you can do a lot of really great things with Tinkercad. So I'm going to show you this real quick. This is making three very silly things. Uh, not silly, but just simple things. So here we go. So again, dragging a primitive on. There's a whole list of primitives that you can choose from. This is just going to be making a basic house. Tinkercad is great for younger kids, great for, um, great for kids who are used to something like Minecraft, building in, building in basic shapes, building in basic blocks to make larger structures. And like I said, despite the simplicity, some people that I've, like there are some of our most talented Thingiverse designers still use exclusively Tinkercad. One of, the, um, one of the really great benefits of, of, you know, of building in 3D is that instead of just building in solid objects, you can also cut away from the material. So what you'll see is I'm going to make this red block turn it into a hole tool. And I'm basically going to cut a hallway through the, through the building. So it's very visual. Really good for kids with you know spatial or understanding spatial relations, navigating 3D space. A lot of great teaching moments about dimension and how things need to be touching together before you can combine them. Cutting away objects to remove material, save cost or to do something functional. This is, again, going to, it's just going to be showing the whole functionality, so taking an object and cutting into it to make a recognizable shape. Okay. 
didn't have time for background music. Apologize. This was the same program, by the way, that they were using in, uh, you saw the Whippy School video where they were building the harbor. This was the same software that they used to build that whole. This is also the same software that we used in that Build Your Own Country project. So to make those little land tiles, you can see what the process would have looked like. Pull out something, shrink it down, add some terrain on the top, and then export it. This is just showing the text functionality. So to make something like my name tag, you would use, you would use this program, or you could use this program. No, I attached it. You'll see I cut a little hole in there so that I could attach this little guy to it. Yeah, I do the same thing right here. We can make a key ring, something like that. All right, so that's Tinkercad. Again, just showing you the very basics, but the idea is you're building with primitive shapes. Use a combination of building, grouping, and then subtracting to build. And you can make some really complex things just using this, using this software. One really incredible thing about Tinkercad is you can also import models. So if you took a 3D scan of something, or if you downloaded something off Thingiverse, you could import it into here and make a modification to it very quickly. If you wanted to chop off a base or make a statue by adding a base to something, you could do that very quickly by importing an object, pulling in a cylinder, plopping it on top, grouping them, and exporting it. So the process, by the way, that you'll see from every single one of these programs, once I get to the phase where I have a model that I want to print, I'm going to export it as an STL or an OBJ file. And I'm going to then bring that into MakerBot Desktop. That's like the universal, uh, those are the universal 3D printing files. OK, let me show you um, three more. And then I will take a couple more questions, and then we'll go into some more resources. OK, so that was Tinkercad. This one is OpenSCAD. I'm just going to go through in the order of the, oh, excuse me. Let me mirror my, yeah, sorry about that. Let me mirror my display. So OpenSCAD, this is, like I said, I'm just going to go through in the same order that MakerBot in the classroom goes through. Arrangement. OK. Should be able to see this. Yes, OK. So this is OpenSCAD. As you can tell, it's quite a bit different than Tinkercad, a little bit less visual, a lot more text. So on the left here, what you're looking at is the code that outputs the model that you see here on the right. So for example, if I wanted to make myself a little name tag, I would change the variable called my word. I would change it to true. And then I would compile it. Changes the model itself, right? I'm not directly editing the model. I'm instead, I'm, I'm editing the code that outputs the model. This is a free download. All of these, yeah, every, every software. This one is downloadable, not browser-based. So as you can tell, like I, like I walked through the example, now that I've adjusted my name tag, or my name size, my actual text of my name, I need to adjust the variables that define the box to fit it. So these variables are defined about down here. I'm breezing through this, by the way, this whole project. There's all the text explains what happens here. But if I wanted to change this, I'd go in, edit a couple of variables. I can also change some variables that dictate what the border of my object looks like, of my name tag looks like. So for example, the frequency of the kind of the wave that, is, that you see on the border. So I change that to like a 2, from 1 to 2. You can see that it actually makes two waves. If I wanted to make it less blocky, I would change the number of steps. Again, just changing the variables. Make it a bit more smooth. If you're teaching calculus, you can see that there's a lot of great applications here. We're talking sine curves. We're talking Riemann sums. And then all through here, there's a lot of great, you know, the, basically the more advanced you want to get, the deeper into the code you go. If you want to stay at the top, just changing a couple variables, that's great for middle school level, elementary school level. If you want to get more advanced high school level, you go in and tr start to dictate you know, the actual math that, that, tra that translates to the 3D model. So that's OpenSCAD. 
Um, let us show you, let me show you Sculptress. Everybody see this? Yeah. So Sculptress, this is a digital sculpting program. This is what the program that we made the fossils in. So I'll see if I can do something quickly, see if I can replicate one of those fossils quickly. But basically Sculptress, much different than the other two. Um, there's basically, there's no history, there's no tree, there's no parameters. What you're doing is you're given a digital ball of clay and you can go through and just edit it, mush it around. Right? So if I wanted to, I'll see if you put me on the spot, but I'm going to see if I uh, can make that little like Nautilus shell fossil that was passed around. The way I would do that is I have all my brushes up here. I'm going to use what's called my flatten brush. I click a million times to make this kind of like a flat hockey puck. All right, something like that. I'm going to use my grab brush, which will let me just kind of pull some of the material. And then I'm going to use my draw brush, which adds digital clay to my model. So if I do something like this, see if I can make a nice spiral. Oh, that was terrible. Hold on. Make a spiral, doesn't have to be perfect. Go through and clean up some of these creases. Maybe go in and add some detail like you see on the actual model itself. One of the cool things about sculpting digitally is that you can have what's called a symmetry line, which basically everything I'm doing to this side of it will be mirrored on the back side. So you'll see when I flip the whole model around. When I flip the whole model around, it's mirrored on the other side as well. Great for art applications. I could go through and polish this up if I wanted to. And then same thing, I can export this file and I have a 3D printable file. Kind of cool, right? Yes. Yes, indeed. OK, let me show you the last one, and then I know i got some questions that are building. So let me go through the last one quickly, and then I'll take questions. So this one is 1-2-3-D Design. This is a downloadable program, just like Sculptress and OpenSCAD. 1-2-3-D Design, think of, as a, think of as a good step up from Tinkercad. So if you use Tinkercad, you get really good at it. 1-2-3-D um, Design is a great next step. They're both from Autodesk. The difference between Tinkercad and 1-2-3-D Design is that 1-2-3-D Design allows you to actually draw and create solids based on your drawings. So for example, if I wanted to build a house in 1-2-3-D Design, I could go through and sketch, sketch a rectangle. Could use what's called an extrude, which means I can pull it up into 3D space. Eighty. Go through and add some roofs using a chamfer tool. And then, similar to using the whole function in Tinkercad, I can actually sketch and extrude inward. One of the benefits of being able to sketch something is, you know, this object I could have also made in Tinkercad, but something like this, say I wanted to make like a vase, for example. Could sketch a little profile like that. I don't know how this is going to turn out, but we'll see. Kind of sketch like a side profile of something, and then you can use what's called a revolve function, which basically lets me create a solid about an axis, so I can sweep this around. In this case, I'd want a full 360 degrees. Hide my sketches, turn off my plane so you can see it. And then I could go through and just shell this object, which basically means take out the meat of it. And then I have a vase. 
So that's the benefit of being able to sketch something. And then I could also, obviously, I could go back. I could modify that sketch. I could create a new solid based on that sketch instead of building things by using primitive shapes. So it's a good step up. There's obviously a bit of a steeper learning curve using something like 1, 2, 3D design. But the ideas are still there. If you've learned to navigate in 3D space and Tinkercad, a lot of those skills translate to 1, 2, 3D design. To review a little bit, the free 3D modeling options that are available that we work with a lot or that we hear about people working with a lot are these. You will recognize a lot of them. Tinkercad Sculptures 1, 2, 3D design. We just went through all of those. Autodesk Mesh Mixer and Blender are two incredibly powerful softwares, software packages. A little bit more on the advanced side. Um, Mesh Mixer is great for repairing files. Blender is incredibly versatile, but the learning curve is a bit steep. steep. OpenSCAD you saw. SketchUp is probably the most popular of all of them. The only thing about SketchUp, the only reason that I hesitate a little bit to recommend SketchUp to first time users, if it's for the purposes of 3D printing, is that there are a couple considerations you have to keep in mind when you're designing a thing to ensure that it will print properly. All right. On the paid side, on the commercial side, these are, again, just a sampling of some of the software packages available. So I've broken them up into the different types of modeling. So on your solid modeling, these are used by your engineers, product designers, people like that. We have SolidWorks, probably the most popular. Autodesk Inventor, and a program called Rhino, Rhinoceros. All of those, you're creating solid objects. Great for making parts if you're prototyping parts. Surface modeling, these tools are used a lot by animation studios, video game developers, people making like animated movies. A lot of times in addition to the other programs down at the bottom here. 3ds Max and Maya are probably the most popular, both by Autodesk. Cinema 4D and Silo are two other options. And then we have digital sculpting. So these would be like, think of Sculptress, but with a lot more functionality. You have your ZBrush, probably the most popular. Autodesk also has one, Mudbox. And then there's a program called 3D Coat, all which allow you to sculpt digitally. And there's some pretty amazing things that people have done with digital sculpting tools. All of these range anywhere from, like ZBrush, for example, I believe is like $800 to $1,000 for a license, all the way up through something like SolidWorks, which is in the five to $10,000 per license range. You get very pricey. A lot of, I know Autodesk has an initiative where schools can get free access to their entire suite of software packages, which is like an incredible offering. I don't know what the stipulations or requirements are, but I know a lot of schools that I've worked with have all of the Autodesk software packages, which is like an unbelievable deal. So if, if you're at a school, I would definitely look into that if you're interested. And then because um, I get asked a lot, I finally, I made this slide just to show you what, if you're working exclusively from, exclusively from an iPad, or if your students are using iPads, um, these are some great iPad apps. There are a few more than this, but these are the ones that I would recommend to get started. You have MakerBot Print Shop, that's our app. Allows you to do a couple things, like make a vase, make a metal, or recently we re introduced this Shape Maker, which is what I was talking about, where you can draw something or take a picture of a logo and turn it into a 3D model. And you can export that directly to print. 1, 2, 3D Sculpt is kind of similar to Sculptress. You're digitally sculpting. You're just using it on iPad, so you're drawing it out with your fingers. Tinker Play is an extension of um, Tinkercad, where you create 3D printable action figures that are actually really awesome. And then 1, 2, 3D Design also has a comparable iPad app that allows you to drag and drop some shapes and build some objects. OK, last thing I'm going to talk to you about is Thingiverse. So I've been mentioning Thingiverse this whole time. Um, Thingiverse is our online community where people upload, share, and download 3D printable files. So like I said, there's close to a million free downloadable files on Thingiverse currently. Everything's shared under the Creative Commons license. So you, if you upload something, you can say how you wish people to use it and to share it. Tons of educators on there, engineers, tinkers, all people talking about 3D printing. There's a lot of great educational content on there, um, as, as long as you know where the right place to look is. For example, over the summer, we ran five STEAM challenges, five educational, education-inspired challenges. There was um, one for each of the major subjects. So we had science, technology, engineering, art, and math. 
on a challenge on Thingiverse basically means there was a posed challenge and people submitted entries as part of that challenge. So for example, the science challenge was to make something that floats. And then for all of these, we encouraged people to upload lesson plans that went along with them. So the entries that came like were actually really astonishingly amazing. Some of them were simple demonstration files. Some of them were full-blown lesson plans. For example, this one, which came from the science challenge, the GoGo -Go Airboat. This was like a, it's actually a really incredible design. Basically, it's a, it's a 3D printable boat um, with some circuitry in there that senses a certain payload. The payload is like a little container full of pennies. When you put a certain amount of weight in there, it'll, there's a floating sensor that the water level pushes up. When it triggers, it, you know, when it gets to a certain level, it triggers the motor, which spins this little fan, and then the boat starts going. So an amazing model, and then even more incredible, is this is the table of contents within the instructions of all of the things that this, um, this user, make a, make a Cat, I think is his name, um, built an entire lesson plan around this. So circuit plans and learning objectives, you know, physics problems that go along with it, recommended tools, questions for answering you know, from the students, tons and tons of great information that you could pull from you know, and adapt to your needs. A couple other cool things that came out of the Steam challenges for, on Thingiverse. On the left here, you have a, a mock-up of a wind turbine. This is a, the idea here is that using, um, using a wind turbine but storing the energy and gravity, so lifting up a giant weight instead of storing it in a battery, which is a really, really um, interesting concept. And this is a scale model, a functional scale model of that. From the art challenge, somebody designed a fully 3D printable model of the giant Ferris wheel in Vienna, which is like an incredibly detailed and complex model. I think it stands probably about two or three feet tall. All the parts 3D printed and fit together. And then on the right here, we have this 3D printable, um, it's a beehive-inspired random light generator. So within here, again, tons of information, including the circuit diagrams, how to build it, lessons learned from it things that you could take and adapt to your classroom. Also on Thingiverse, there are, this is a, a recent feature. We have groups on there. One of the most popular education-based groups is called Classroom 3D. So within there is basically a discussion board with all educators who are talking about using 3D printing in their classrooms and some of the challenges and questions that go along with that. And with, because it's in Thingiverse, you can tag things like, oh, go check out this thing that's been posted that's really great. So you can get a lot of great ideas or ask questions to other educators who are using 3D printing in their classrooms and get some of your questions answered. OK, so just to recap real quick, because I've thrown a lot at you. Things that if you're looking to get started that you, should definitely, that you should definitely be looking at are, one, how are people doing it currently? Try to give you a breakdown of from the simple to the complex versions of integrating it into your classroom. Two, use MakerBot in the classroom. We're really proud of that resource that we built. Please use it. We are hoping it gets that it spreads far and wide and that people use it and tell us about how they're using it. And lastly, tap into the resources uh, to help get you started. So use Thingiverse. Download those free 3D, 3D modeling files, or 3D modeling programs, excuse me. And then each of them have their corresponding uh, groups also that you can research, see what other people are doing with them. Go jump on YouTube and see what people are doing with any of those programs. Uh, and like I said, Thingiverse is, a, is an amazing resource. OK. That's all I got. So I will, I think we have quite a bit of time left. So what I'm going to do is just kind of stand up here, and you guys can throw questions at me as you see fit. And otherwise, if you choose to leave, thank you for listening to me. Whether you're a hobbyist or a professional, b &H has the answers to your questions. Experience a world of technology at our New York City Superstore. Connect with us online or give us a call. Our staff of experts is happy to help.